going on everybody i'd like to welcome y'all back to sync music mondays man every monday 8 p.m eastern standard time financial literacy for your music for musicians man y'all know what it is y'all know the vibes man big shout out to all the listeners everybody that's got us charting on these charts man we charting in nigeria we're charting over in sweden italy like big shout outs to y'all man we appreciate the love and we do this for y'all. That's what this is for, to make sure that musicians globally have financial literacy, how to monetize their music from price to scale. All right. So big shout out to my brother JS, a.k.a. the best. He couldn't be here today, man. He's traveling from D.C. Uh, shout out to my guy, Robert. And as always, we're going to get it started with the word of the day. And the word of the day is one that I love, man. It's my mantra. It's persistence, wears down resistance. So a lot of times in life, you might have obstacles, you know what I'm saying? Things that kind of just try to hold you back or derail you. But you always got to remain persistent. You know, there's a saying I love, you hang around the basket long enough, you get a rebound. You know what I'm saying? So consistently just apply pressure, do what you got to do. And that is the word of the day. All right. But for today... We have a very, very special, dope, talented brother in the building, man. I mean, he's just phenomenal. His music is fire. He's gotten so many placements, man. I mean, I can't even run them all down. I'm going to let him do that for y'all, man. It is no other than the brother, the GOAT, the Raj. What's up, man? What's going on, King? Come on, man. We in the building. K Sparks. What's happening? It's hard <laughs> to be here, dude. <laughs> Bro, I like that. Persistence wears down resistance. Is that what you said? Yeah, yeah. That's it. Gosh, that's like such a loaded phrase, like in and of itself. We probably dig more into it. I love that, dude. Definitely, definitely, man. Yeah, it's like, you know, just staying persistent no matter what. Gotta pursue those goals, you know? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Right. Definitely, definitely, brother. So look, we happy to have you on the show, man. And um just want to dig deep, man, in terms of like when you got started to present day. So I kind of gave everybody like a brief overview of you, but you know, tell them in your own words exactly who is Diraj. Hey man, so uh I am an artist, uh predominantly in the hip hop space, uh, with a big focus on sync, licensing my music for uh TV and film, uh games, ads, trailers, all that kind of stuff. Um, so my music personally has gotten uh, placements with uh, the NBCs, the Foxes, the MTVs, the BETs, the T-Mobile, Samsung. Um, one of our more noteworthy ones is we got uh, one of the trailers for Wakanda Forever, um, Disney Plus Cruella trailer. Um, so it's, I'm a big advocate for the space. Um, you know, it really transformed my artist career. And I'll get back or get into just kind of where I started and, and, you know, when I made the transition with licensing, but some of the other hats that I wear, I'm also an educator. So uh, top of last year, started a course called the Indie Music Accelerator, and it's a, uh, a comprehensive course just giving indie artists and producers a blueprint of just how to do this thing, which we call licensing um, from just 101 to uh, how you pitch your music, how do you create the music that brands actually want and need, um, you know, how to get your files right in order, how to, you know, navigate through different contract types, and then, you know, how you actually pitch and nurture the process to build a sustainable career out of it. And so um, they have a lot of fun from that, you know, students have been landing placements uh, from it. So that's been, you know, really encouraging to see, and it was a big part of just my, I guess, values just to teach and give back and mentor in that kind of capacity. And then, uh, lastly, I'm also a CEO founder of See and Hear. Um, See and Hear. So we are a boutique music house uh, focusing on hip hop, pop, R and B for TV, film, ads, and games. And um, you know that's our niche uh, boutique. Just repositioned the company a couple of, last year. Um, and uh, yeah, it's been, it's been really dope. It's been growing. And yeah, like I'm excited, man. Like I've I had an interesting journey just with music in general. Uh, oddly enough, I didn't plan to do music full time. Like it kind of 
it, it kind of happened, I, I guess, if you could say. I, I've always been like the creative type. So even when I was young, I was always like, you know, drawing or, you know, I, I got into photography and digital arts and design, actually my background. So I have a bachelor's in digital arts um, and design um, from Full Sail University is where I graduated from. Um, but I was always just a creative, you know, one out of the bunch. And music was just another extension of it. Um, and what actually got me into music with my older brother, uh, just little brother wanted to be like big brother. He had a group that he was a part of when I was in like elementary school and they used to come to the house. And, you know, I got a lot of like probably my musical taste from him and whatever he liked. I like, you know, type vibe. Um, so yeah, just, it, it got, it's, it got started from there and it was always just a hobby. Um, and this is back in, I'll, I kind of, you know, give a little bit of, um, of a timeline. Um, so I'm originally from the DMV area. So PG County, Maryland is, you know, where I've, I spent a good majority of my early years. Um, then I ended up moving to um, Richmond, Virginia around like middle of my ninth grade year, um, moved down with my mom. And that transition, there was just a lot of uh, lifestyle internal things that were going on. So ended up um, moving down there, started going to church, gave my life to God, started writing music as an extension of like expressing my faith and doing ministry and all that kind of stuff. And we had a community around that. So it gave me a, a good little hub to just nurture like that creative side of music. But again, it was still just like a hobby, you know, it was community, it was, you know, ministry, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then when I transitioned down to where I am now in Orlando, Florida, like in late 2007, and I moved specifically to for school, I mentioned I graduated from Full Sail. Um, just kind of kept it up, you know, I was doing stuff in and out of the city, um, started doing open mics and bars and churches and outreaches and wherever, you know, I was invited just to, uh, just to perform and share, uh, share my gift. And it wasn't until like late 2013 or so when I guess stuff started to come into question a little bit, cause my track was just like, yo, I'm gonna do design and branding. Like that's my whole deal. And music started to become a little bit more of a disruptor in a sense that I was starting to get known a little bit more in the space. And then, especially in the Christian hip hop world, there was just like, a, it still is, but it was like a really thriving community, um, even around here in Orlando. Um, so long story short, like my design background gave me a, a, a few different unique opportunities. So I was doing a lot of artwork for different artists. Um, and then ended up getting connected to a label uh, based out of Nashville called Reflection Music Group. Um, just for context, if anybody's ever heard of Lecrae, um, Lecrae owns Reach Records. Reach Records is uh, kind of an official, unofficial like sister label. Um, or excuse me, RMG is like an unofficial, official um, sister label to what Reach is. Um, and the co the co owner of RMG, Derek Minor, used to be signed with Lecrae and them. Uh, so just context for anybody, but. Um, I got connected with them because they were looking for a designer for some of their upcoming projects. So I was doing like t-shirt design and merch design and flyers and CD artwork for their artists. And then they later found out that I did music and just loved the whole package. And we started talking, you know, contracts and all this other kind of stuff. And um, in a matter of time, I ended up, you know, being a signed artist where, again, I wasn't planning on that. It's just by nature of me just doing what was innate and natural to me um you know just landed there and so that was about 2014 is when I got signed to the label and I was there from um then until about mid 2019 um and so how sync kind of plays into this this whole thing was literally the first year that I got signed um is when I got my first placement I was you know 2014 and it was it was one of the things kind of happened out of the blue um, I was actually the first artist on the label to ever get a placement. It was with ESPN's first take. Uh, and it, it just clicked for me. I was like, yo, like it, it put my music in a different category. And my mind was like, wow, this, like, I guess the music is good because it's like a freaking ESPN, you know what I'm saying? Was to use it for the program. And I didn't even know how to do that. I wasn't even thinking about doing that in any capacity. It's just entered to my world. And I was just hooked, you know what I mean? And so during that time, I just kept trying to figure out how to do more of it and just letting the note, label know I was interested. And they started to try to make uh, um, partnerships and, and figure out how to do it more. 
because uh, it was new for them as well. But anyway, fast forward in about 2019, it, it kind of got to a place where I knew it was time to transition out. And when I did, I knew I, I wanted I wanted sync to be that focus. So I took like literally I told myself I gave myself like six months and said, this is all that you're doing. You know, what I mean, like you're just going to figure out how to license your music and, and get into the space. And during that time, I wasn't on shows. I wasn't like trying to sell merch or run my numbers up. Even on social media, I probably lost like a couple thousand followers just because I was so ghost. Mm. Um, but I was able to build a whole nother network on the other side um, that could actually monetize my music more than what I was seeing. Like wow. even when I was with the label, because I was broke, you know, still on the label. Mm. Um, but uh, but yeah, man. And so you know, now fast forward, and it's I, I was able to you know get a good amount of traction. I feel like in a, in a short amount of time and. I love it. And I, I just feel like it's something every artist, if they're not like, even if they're not all in on it, it just need, they, there needs to be awareness and needs to be a part of their strategy because you just leaving a lot of money on the table and it's so easy to implement. You know what I mean? Like it doesn't take a lot to, you know, make the shift into it. You know, um, you just got to understand like it's available for you. So yeah. that's, that's my story. <laughs> <laughs> yo, <laughs> long short, you know, but yo, but you know what? I love it because in your story, as I'm hearing you talk, you know, there was points in your career where you were able to pivot and that's like yeah. a, an important critical thing. You know, like we always talk about that, especially on this show was like the ability to adapt and overcome. So sometimes when you see things going a certain way, you're able to say, all right, you know what? I'm going to flip this. I'm going to do it a different way because I see right. better opportunity for growth, you know? Right. And, yeah. um, you know, and even I, you know, when you said the thing about losing followers on social media, it's like, you know, sometimes you take a loss to get a win. That's how life works. So, you know, you had to take that little hit. But on the other side of that, it was just a bigger blessing with all these things, you know? Yeah, big time. And I think when I left the label, I was probably around maybe like 15K followers or something like that. Um, but if you look now, I'm like, I'm at like 22 K. So it's like social media is fickle anyway. You know what I mean? It's like, are you, you could, you could re regress from it and come back and now like almost like nothing happened and still build an audience. Like as long as you know how to add value, I think that's the biggest thing. So that's it. You know, that's it. I want to, yeah, yeah. That's, that's a big fact, big fact, man. You know, I want to kind of, um, piggyback off of what you said a little bit, cause you talked about your faith and your belief in God and things like that. Like, how does that play a, a role like in your music like is it um you know would you say it helps you because i know obviously there's no profanity in the records that you make and i know a lot of times music supervisors they want clean records so i'm thinking that gives you an advantage too because it's like you don't got to send clean records like they already clean right right yeah that's what, that was one thing i started to pick up on because i mean it's true the the majority like you'll open up you'll open yourself up for more opportunities uh, if you have clean music, you know what I mean? And and not to say that every, because obviously we've seen shows where, and even supervisor requests, like, give me the dirtiest stuff you got, you know what I mean? And it's it's not a hindrance um, in, as far as getting placements, but it can limit opportunities if all your stuff is just that, um, or at least if you don't have a clean alt, you know, alt version of an explicit song. But yeah, like for me, coming up in the CHA space, the Christian hip hop space, like that's just you know it's it's a part of it like you don't find a lot of cats that are using profanity and stuff like that uh, for obvious reasons um in, in most cases um but it, it it's it's funny because when I, I came in into the space I was thinking of like people like coming from the CHA space like they do I feel like have an advantage because our norm is writing without it so we have to like we have certain restrictions you know quote unquote on how we write and i think it's just get, taught us how to get good within those you know norms like with the, that are specific to the genre um so yeah man i think it, it just gave me a little bit of a head start you know what i mean but I, I feel like if you're a good writer you know what i mean like you can easily transition into that and you know switch, swap words out and stuff like that so it's an easy pivot i feel like yeah yeah definitely man i even know um Andy Minio, he's gotten a lot of records placed, you know, like a lot of records. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know, whatever record it was, I forgot it was, but I saw he had a record. I think it went gold or something like that. But that song was like heavily synced, like in ESPN, Sports Sorry, Center. You can't stop me. 
Yes, that's the record. That's the record. And you know, that's that's what artists don't realize is, you know, the propensity for your record to explode just being used in TV and film. And of course, when people hear it, what they gonna do? They're gonna look for it. They're gonna shazam it, they're gonna check it, they're gonna stream it, those numbers go through the roof, and you're able to monetize that, especially if you own the record. You know, if you got like a, a, a you know, a not a non-exclusive a deal over here and deal over there, man. You you own that record. That's your baby, you know? Yeah, yeah. That I mean that one the one thing about that song too, it's just a really good song. Like I remember when that song came out, like it went crazy in the space. And Andy's just a, a great artist in general. Um so he has a lot of records that you know kind of can do that. But if you really study that particular record, you kind of see what it's got going for him because it has this whole overcoming like angle to it where it's like bro like whatever you throw at me you can't stop me and it emotes so well you know what i mean like in that chorus he's screaming like at the top of his lungs where i feel like everybody kind of has like either has or wants to get to that place where they're just like internally they just feel like they just want to scream like yo you cannot like i feel like i run through a wall right now you know what i mean because i'm so determined and so i, I think it, it just became really anthemic and spoke to that part of people, but also too, like brands eat that stuff up. You know what I mean? Cause I mean, you know, I always tell my students like brands are trying to do like one or two things. They're either trying to uh, tell a story or sell a product like, or both, you know what I mean? And so if they can, you know, really elicit a response from their audience in their marketing material and the music supports that end goal, then it's, it's just a really great match. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's just a good pairing overall. Uh, Cause you, we always have to think of who is this actually for? Like, what's the, what's the utility of this song and, or this commercial? Like, what is it? What's the end result? Because they're not putting thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars in an ad for no reason. You know what I mean? Like it's the bills, it gets some kind of return and our music needs to, like, we need to be empathetic and understanding of, of the needs of brands so that we can, you know, create songs that serve that need. You feel me? Absolutely. Absolutely. And yeah, I agree with that. Like, you know, being intentional, that's a major key that we tell all artists, like, make sure that you're intentional with your music. Like when you're making a song, like make sure that you have some type of structure to that song. So when brands are looking for something, whether it's a song about love, whether it's a high intensity song, at least they can actually look at that and say, all right, they look at the metadata and say, all right, look, this is a song about this, this fits this vibe, you know, just don't, um, you know, go in the booth shooting blind, you know, just making a hundred bars, lyrical miracle, like, <laughs> you know, like that, that it, it don't it, it doesn't really like serve a purpose in this space, you know. And then I tell artists too is like be careful in regards to like brand dropping. Like you know, you want records that are universal. So unless Coca Cola reaches out you directly and says, "Hey, look, we want to give you ten thousand to do this record for us." All right, cool. That's you know case specific, but you know try to remain broad. You know, don't drop too many names and songs because then you know if you're talking about Taco Bell, but McDonald's wants to use it. You got a conflict of interest right there, you know? And I feel like that's so, I feel like no other genre really deals with that other than like hip hop or like like hip hop and R&B because we're the most, I mean, I mean, you'll find it occasionally in pop, but I don't know. I just feel like that's just the essence of hip hop in the sense where, you know, we'll, we'll flaunt, we'll brag. And a lot of that is associated with the brands that we have because we know that they're premium and all that kind of stuff. And so, you know, we just, it's so funny because I feel like a lot of times we just giving brands like free marketing and free promotion. <laughs> like, that's, that's a fact. That's a, that's a fact. Yeah, you know, that, that made me think about Hove, man. If, if you remember when Hove was um bigging up Chris Stahl and all that, then the owner came behind him and was like, yeah, we don't want these hip hop people uh, buying our stuff. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. So it's crazy. <laughs> it's crazy, man. Wow. Yeah. Wow, man. Yeah. But I, but yeah, I, I think that's, that's true, man. Like, um, just knowing and one thing I'm gonna to say too, and I I heard this from different panels from supervisors, and I would encourage everybody to watch, like, you know, if, if just go on YouTube and look up, you know, supervisor or interviews with music supervisors and, and just listen to how they talk about their needs. Cause that's the like that's a big indication of how to anticipate the need before it comes to need. And you'll start to see like trends and, and repetition from how they like their music or how they advise and 
um, artists to submit or just what they look like. That's that's usually like the best data because they're effectively the ones who need the music. Um, you know, they middleman for the directors, but you got to, you know, kind of get them on your side and uh, make their jobs easier. But doing all of the things that we're talking about, like having, you know, clean versions or not like being sensitive to know, like, may not be the best, you know, idea to, you know, drop, you know, three different brands in the same song, because if a, a, po a, a brand that's a competitor wants to use it, then you just really nix the opportunity. Um, so yeah, man, but like, listen to supervisors and, and pay attention to how they communicate their needs, because if you're able to um, understand them deeply, then it's going to put you in a favorite place and it just opens you up for more potential licensing opportunities. Big facts. Big facts, man. That's a big gem right there, man. Big gem. You know, I want to um, I want to kind of pivot and I want to ask you like, and I don't know if you remember, man, because you got so many placements, but what was your first placement that you got and how that feel when you got that, man? Like, what was that feeling? Well, yeah, like what I was saying, the, my very first placement was with ESPN and that joint, like that's when it, and I, I was, I was actually, I was telling you earlier, we spoke on a panel at NAM, um, and I remember recalling it. Somebody, I think, I think it was I was talking about on that panel, but they were just asking me if I remember like how much it was or any of that kind of stuff. It wasn't a lot. I, I can remember that, but I don't remember specifically how much it was. But for me, it really didn't matter because it was just like my music got used on a national platform that everybody knows, you know what I mean? And that that association was enough for me to be like, all right, there's something, there's something to this thing and we need to figure it out. But I mean, it legit so to see like in me and, and it's so funny, man, cause like, I, like, I, I never even thought about it because when I, and I've, I've learned this about other artists too. Like when I first started and I got signed to the label, bro, like I had, no frame of reference of any of the business side like I didn't know what a PRO was like my you know my label was telling me to sign up like I don't know what it is all I know is that like this is where I collect royalties you know what I mean and I don't even know like how, what royalties or how many I, I didn't even know there were different types of royalties you know what I mean so it, it just became that for me early on so I was just really green real ignorant um like coming into the space but the interesting thing is that, you know, I was fortunate enough to have a good friend and still to this day, she's a mentor of mine, but she's also an attorney. She has her own practice, but uh, she was the one that helped me in my first deal with the label. And I had a project that, cause I, I used to also um, produce, I don't produce as much anymore, um, but early on I would produce and write and like mix and that. And the project, like I already had a project kind of ready to go before I got signed and that became um, you know, the first EP that I released. And originally we were going to like absorb that project into the deal, you know, where they would, you know, co-own it, all this other kind of stuff. But um, she was just like, no, like you should license it to them, you know, because it's already done. I didn't even know what the free damn thing. Like, I'm just I'm like, sure, you're advising it, you know, let's go. And we, you know, fall for it and got it. And then I remember a couple of years later, it reverted back uh, to me. And then I, I was just thinking about it, like once I left the label and I started licensing my music, I was like, yo, like my very first, I guess, formal deal with any real music entity was licensing. And now all I do with my music is license it now, or not all I do, but the majority of what we do is licensing. Mm -hmm. So it was a real interesting full circle moment. You know, I guess God is funny like that, but it was, it just, it just hit me. I'm like, yo, I've been licensing, you know, before I even knew. What I was. <laughs> that's, a, that's a fact, man. That's a fact. It's like sometimes, and you know what? It's a saying that I love too, it's um, rejection is God's protection. So a lot of times in life, it's like, you know, we, like you know what I'm saying? A lot of times like we moving and we headed down a certain path and, you know, we got to just be bumped over just a little bit to say, nah, you ain't going to go this way. You're going to go that way. That's because, you know, there's like just always better and greater. So, you know, the fact that, you know, and given the actual current state of the music industry, just looking at how things change, like transitioning from tape cassettes to CDs, from CDs to MP3s to streaming, like you see how artists nowadays, they're not fairly compensated. Like, you know, for a stream on Spotify or like, you know, just a play on YouTube, 
it's really like criminal, like you know, predatory. Like how you know what I'm saying? It's like, like how do you do this? Yeah, it's like you know, you see the Spotify wrapped, and that's cool. But I mean, you know, how much bread are people really making off of these streams? You know, when you it looks great at face value, but I mean, you're just really putting the lipstick on the pig at the end of the day because you know it's like people really ain't monetizing. You know, you got to run it up pretty heavy. Um, to see like significant money off of the streaming. Um, but one thing I was going to say, so I want to kind of go back to, and this is kind of in line with what you're talking about, like the ways that an artist can build a music career now just look vastly different. And I feel like, you know, years prior to where we didn't have the same access to marketing on our own. We didn't have the same tech to create the type of quality of music. We didn't probably didn't have the same as as much creativity as we do now i just feel like like and i don't know if it was always there or and we just didn't have full-on access to it but part of me just feels like because like society has just gotten more on demand and it, it's just providing more and more resources to just the independent creator or just society at large to do things that would have you know required you to spend tens of thousands of dollars to equate to we could do for a subscription like a monthly subscription um, but and why I bring that up is because and that's why I say like licensing should be a part of the strategy. And even the way that you do deals, like with major entities can en entities can be different. I was at South by Southwest, um, you know, a couple months ago, and there was a panel that um, Armani White was on, uh, who did like the you know the big Billy Eilish song. Um, and it was it was really cool. And actually, if you go to my Instagram um, on my reels, you'll see I, I did a live and asked him a question. I was like, he started talking about how the deal that he did with the label that he's a part of or he partnered with uh, was a licensing deal. So, you know, he created the music and he did a, a licensing, uh, you know, arrangement where he still controls and keeps, you know, his ownership, but they exploit the music in a particular way. And this is not, you know, licensing and, and how we're talking with like synchronization. Um, it's just the permission for the label to use it and monetize it and exploit it in a particular way. And that's the same thing we're effectively doing with brands. But that's another thing where as 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 you're growing, you know, and, and typically like you have to have something that you're bringing to the table for labels to kind of entertain stuff like that. But it just shows the power of like the power and the options that exist for independent artists now, because back in the day, um, I, I'd assume, I don't have any data, but I assume that was probably very rare, you know what I mean, for yeah. just because of what it would take to actually produce, you know, commercially viable record. Like typically that, that's where labels would come in. Like they would front those costs and bring in the writers and producers to create this stuff. And it just, it costs a lot of money now. You can do it in your bedroom and get effectively just you know get a hit you know what I mean so so it's it's crazy you know what I mean like it's crazy yeah yeah that's a fact man and you know it's it's dope too especially for like artists in this present landscape like we were saying there's so much opportunity because the major artists like you know there's major price tags attached to that so when you got a music supervisor they might be on a limited budget you know they want to compensate but they don't want to pay you know 250k for a Kanye West record you know what I'm saying so you know if you're con yeah or more right yeah half a half a half, yeah half half a mil <laughs> you know what i'm saying so get that yeezus record so jay-z was talking about that like he had a million on a sink he said it in one of the songs i can't remember yeah, he and said that, he got yeah yeah see these prices they charge and so it's like you know when you got that skill set and you talented as a musician man you could be that go-to person where it's like you know your music will be first in line you know so right. Yeah, it's just it's, it's a game changer, man. Like it's it's a real game changer. I mean, for me personally, it changed my life because prior to two thousand and you know seven, I was pretty much doing it the traditional way. Like I had record deals, you know. I did a record on um one of Nick Cannon's projects. Um, you know, my, yeah, Cuddy Man, all, all kinds of cats, man. You know, I was doing records with and um, you know, but it was just different back then. It was more grunt work. It was a labor of love. It's like you know, if you wanna uh. You got a to tour, you know, you got to be on, on, on the road for a certain amount of months out of the year. You got to do radio. You got to do appearances. You know, the beautiful thing with Sync, man, your music will go places that you don't have to be, you know? So, you know. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? I'm like. You could literally create a sustainable 
six figure salary all for your music all from home like yep. you don't gotta you know you don't gotta do a lick of traveling like if yep. you if you really want to so it's, it's yep. wild yeah